everything that we do from our customer evaluations to the technology that we build to the roadmaps that we have everything converges with one thing in mind and that's to serve you the customer sharewell provides enterprise power without the, the cost and complexity i've got a system that i can customize with little training. Never have to write a line of code and never need a developer level resource to touch the tool. Having this portal and being able to integrate it with our existing SharePoint sites and being able to provide on-demand reports and searches. Anything that you can conceive of that you need to automate and integrate you can build. Within days of receiving the product, it was plugged into our virtual environment. It's a game changer. Most of our competition, you'll find out, is built on old legacy technology. We can get you up and running as quickly as possible, and yet you'll never outgrow us. Our software and our technology was built on the latest, most innovative technology available today. Whether you have it on-premise and bring it into our hosted environment, or take it from our hosted environment and bring it on-premise, it doesn't matter. It's about people. It's share well. It's in the relationships that we build. At the end of the meeting, he turned to me and he says, you guys have got the deal. And I said, well, why? What, what made the difference? And he says, it's, it's the way Sherwell treated us. We don't get it right every time. We listened, we identified the problem, and then we worked through the solution together. You need to be worried about your legacy. Your legacy is based upon the tools and the people that you employ and how cost effective and what the quality is. So keeping this simple and not expensive and easy to maintain saves you a lot. Hello, my name is Mark Fay from Sharewell Software. We're a proud sponsor of TFT 2014, bringing great ITSM content to the world. Please enjoy this next presentation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TFT 14. My name is Roger Williams, and in this session, Homo Socialists in the Age of Distraction, we're going to be talking about social media. Now, don't close the window just yet, just because I said the word social media. This is not a talk about how to get a million followers on Twitter or something like that. As anyone that knows me can tell you, I'm not an expert on that at all. I'm much more interested in thinking about how it is that we use social media today and how we misuse it. So today we're going to talk about some different examples of ways that social tools are used and then some ways that I think that we'll see it used more often in the future. Now, it's no secret that social media is becoming ever more pervasive and its use continues to expand. For instance, just last year alone, more than 16 million person hours or person years were spent on Facebook in 2013. It's like the entire population of Israel and Switzerland all going on Facebook at midnight January 1 and staying on the entire year. No bathroom breaks, no visits to other sites or anything. And with all that activity going on there and on other social sites, the volume of tweets, alerts, messages, notifications continues to go up. And it's easy to get overwhelmed by all the activity that's coming at us. And it's only going to increase. So you may be one of those folks that's really worried about how am I going to deal with all this? Perhaps you're struggling just to keep up today. If so, I'd like to talk about some of the reasons why we feel like that we need to keep up with everything and some ways that we can approach using social tools more effectively so that we can get value from them without having to spend every waking moment using social media. Now, the most common pattern of usage that, that I tend to see today, uh, I like to refer to this as being homo multitaskus. And I'd like you to meet a representative of homo multitaskus, Tina. Now, you probably know Tina or you know somebody like her. Whenever you're around her, you can barely go a minute without hearing her phone go off with some sort of a notification, buzzing alert message that she's gotten a text or a Facebook post or somebody's mentioned her on Instagram. And whenever you're talking with her, you'll tend to notice her start to look down to her phone whenever she's not talking. As she starts to go through her email feed, checking on her messages, as she goes, yep, uh-huh. I hear you, that sounds terrible. It's not much better whenever you're not around her. She tends to post an awful lot online. And the things that she shares tend to be a lot of cut and paste jobs. 
you'll see pretty much everything that her employer shares, anything from any organization that she may belong to. Uh, you can always count on her for some of the latest memes that are going around the internet, the cute cat photos with captions, various other pictures that are going around. And some of my personal favorite posts, those emotional blackmail posts. 97% of people won't click on this link because they hate me. But if you like me, you're going to like this post. Those sorts of things. Now, the question is, how is it that Tina learned to use tools in this manner? She certainly wasn't taught to do this in school. So what are the things that lead to this kinds of behavior? Well, I think when we look at it, we have to really go back to when we're very young. When we're small, we have authority figures in our life and they demand attention from us. And there's a very good reason why they do that. When we're small, we're not able to take care of ourselves. We don't know that we shouldn't run out into the street or that we shouldn't stick a fork in the electrical outlet in the kitchen. And because of that, these authority figures demand that we pay attention to them whenever they feel like they need to get our attention or there'll be consequences if they don't. Now, again, this is perfectly reasonable that this happens. The issue is that as we get older, others start to use that sort of attention whenever they want it to their advantage. Now, this is obvious in schools and in our other institutions, but we've really started to notice it much more with the rise of mass media, and especially now with the rise of social media. While there were only a handful of newspapers, TV stations, whatnot, that were vying for our attention 30, 40 years ago, now there's literally millions of people that are broadcasting information that demand your attention, that want you to notice them and pay attention to them, preferably so they can then take a slice of your attention and then sell it to an advertiser or someone else so they can then make money. Now, as the number of people that we know grows as we get older and the organizations we belong to, movies we like, the bands that we keep up with, the demand on our attention continues to go up until we eventually reach a point where the demand on our attention actually exceeds the supply that we can give it. Now, when we fall into an attentional deficit like this, it's very distressing for us. So we look for various ways to try to deal with that excess and to cope effectively. The most common way that people try to cope with that is to multitask. Now, it is able, we are able to multitask. If we're making dinner, for instance, and we're making a, a, a three dish dinner, we can cook all three of those dishes at the same time and we can manage that very well. Or if we're doing things that we don't have to think about, we can do those multitask as well, walking and chewing gum at the same time being the classic example of that. But studies in the science pretty clearly show that when it comes to our conscious attention, we can only focus on one thing at a time. And when we try to do more than one thing at a time with our attention, we tend to waste time because of trying to switch between tasks and we do a poorer quality of actually paying attention to either of the things that we're trying to focus on. So as Tina and others like her try to multitask, they end up falling even further behind because demand continues to go up and the supply that we've got continues to stay the same. So what ends up happening is that we then try to increase supply. And we do that by what I like to call Parkinson's law of social media. We start to let social media usage actually come up in every other venue of our lives. Now this starts innocently enough. We check our messages during commercials. We take downtime while we're in line to see what's going on with our email. But eventually what ends up happening for too many people is that they start looking at their phones while they're at dinner, while they're out with their friends and that most dangerous of pastimes today, distracted driving. Now, even if you don't end up dying like thousands of people do in the US every year from distracted driving, just the fact that you're trying to squeeze in usage of social tools into all these other venues ends up causing issues. Presumably you spend most of your time around people that you would like to have some sort of relationship with. And when you're trying to both have a conversation with them and trying to keep up with all of your social feeds at the same time, other folks tend to be put off by that. They just don't like having to compete with another device that's in front of them for their attention. So what ends up happening is that we put up barriers between us and those are, that we want to have close relationships with. So we start to push them away while paradoxically, we actually start to get a little bit closer to a whole lot of people that we may have met a few times and haven't talked to in years. 
Now, the issue, of course, is that there's only a limited amount of supply that we can add into the equation because we still have other things that we need to do with our day. And the demand continues to go up, and we haven't done anything to really address that. So as this continues to occur, what we'll start to see people do is to really focus on that volume that they handle and treat it almost like a status symbol. You start to see this today with uh, a lot of people with email. You know, I had 350 email messages this morning when I came in and I got them all read. Well, like that's some sort of an accomplishment that you've managed to do that. So as we progress, what we'll probably tend to see is that volume and how many people there you're able to follow and keep up with will turn into a status symbol in certain circles if it hasn't already. But the issue with that is that that volume doesn't really give you any value. And what we'll see for folks like Tina is that they're going to tend to spend a whole lot of time devoting their attention to other people's lives and what other people are doing. And they'll distract themselves into ultimately not being able to do the things that they really want to do, have the kinds of relationships that they want to have. And to update a quote that was often been attributed to Paul Songus, no one on their deathbed is wishing that they spent more time on LinkedIn. Now there's a reaction that we see to this mode of, of behavior that is starting to become more and more prevalent. And, and this profile I, I like to refer to as homo hermitus. And in order to represent what that's like, I'd like for you to meet Herman. Now you don't know Herman, in fact, almost nobody does, but you might have used to know someone like him. Now, Herman's not a complete Neanderthal. Let's be clear about that because he does have an email account and he does look at it every once in a while. But you'll rarely see him using any social media sites or other social tools. And if you're ever around Herman, you can barely get into more than a few minutes of conversation before he starts going on on a rant about the latest sort of digital detoxification effort that he's working on, whether it's digital Sabbath, some sort of a a device free boot camp, or he set up a room in his house to be completely without technology, those sorts of activities. And just a lot of really pathologizing about social tools, treating them almost as if they're evil and demonizing them. Now, the issue with this is that it really mistakes the symptom for the problem. If you're familiar with Paul Miller, who recently spent a year not using the internet at all, and then came back on to talk about his experiences. What we tend to find is that when someone doesn't have the internet to distract them, there are plenty of other things around to distract you as well. Uh, in fact, even though this talk is called the age of distraction, the age of distraction didn't start when Friendster and MySpace started back in the mid 2000s. The age of distraction started when we first started to think. And it wouldn't be so bad that there's this demonizing of these tools, except that it ends up really putting the focus of people into areas that just aren't helpful. They start to focus on that 20th century mode of thinking, which is that I have a store of knowledge and I need to protect that store from other people. And that's how I get value from others is by building up my store, not sharing it with others, except in very limited cases where I can definitely get a lot of value from that. And there's a wonderful book called The Power of Pull that really does a good job of describing the, the fallacy within this. And that is that as we become a more connected and networked world, it's not the stores of knowledge that actually make us more valuable and effective. It's actually the flows of knowledge that we're able to tap into that are more effective. And it's that tacit knowledge that we're able to build up that really helps to help us provide value to others. Because unlike explicit knowledge, which is the knowledge that you can write down on a piece of paper or easily put into a document or find through a Google search, tacit knowledge depends on that feedback loop, that continual service improvement for you ITSM geeks like myself, that you try things and you make mistakes because you're trying things that you haven't done before. You learn from those mistakes and then you try again until you start to get better at those things. And the, the disadvantage for folks like Herman is that whenever they exclude social tools, they're really taking away one of the most powerful ways that we have today to start to build tacit knowledge. 
because tacit knowledge depends on building good relationships, deep relationships with other people and being able to expose ourselves to them and be able to take honest, candid feedback from them and use that to improve. We also can learn innovations from other people so that we don't have to learn all those things ourselves and make all of our mistakes. So what ends up happening for folks like Herman is that they miss out on the benefits that social tools can provide in helping us connect to others. We can connect with anybody around the world, find people that are interested in topics we're interested in, that have a similar focus and topic that we do, and they're ultimately able to relate to us in a way that we can then grow our knowledge with them over time. Now, if we're not in those loops and in those networks, what ends up happening is that we start to find, fall behind people. We rely on our store of knowledge, but our store of knowledge becomes less useful because the new knowledge that's being created that others have access to continues to grow. And if we're out of those loops, it really gets a vicious feedback circle going because the less value that we have and the less ability that we have to use social tools and other ways to be able to effectively connect with others, it ultimately ends up putting us further and further behind others. There's less and less value in other people getting to know us. And since they don't know us and don't really have much value in getting to know us, we're further out of those feedback loops and we continue to fall further and further behind. Unfortunately, the end result for folks like Herman is that they're only going to realize a fraction of their potential. They're going to miss a lot of opportunities that they would have had for experiences that not only would have benefited them, it would have also benefited all of the people that would have got to know them. So the question is, if these tendencies don't work, is there a way that we can use our tools more effectively that can ultimately help us to get value from social media without it overrunning our lives? And the good news is that we are seeing effective ways of using tools that allow for a better balance between value and the amount of time that those things take. And this is the profile that I like to refer to as homo socialists. And to introduce you to that, I'd like for you to meet Sophie. Now, you don't know Sophie today, but she's the kind of person that you'd like to get to know. Because when you're around her, she's a pleasure and a joy to be around. The main thing that you'll notice is that whenever she is there, she's actually there. She's present, she's engrossed in conversations with other people. She's talking about things that are of mutual interest to everyone that's there. And if she finds that she's not really interested in the conversation that's going on, she'll either steer the discussion onto something that is more interesting to the group as a whole, or she'll be nice, tactful, and candid that the conversation isn't doing much for her so that she can either help to steer the conversation onto something else or exit the conversation and go do something that's more useful to her. And if you follow Sophie on any of the online social networks, what you'll find is that you don't see as many things being shared by her as you would by someone more in the Tina profile. And there's two main reasons for this. One is that the work that you see from her is not everything that Sophie is sharing. Sophie targets her information just to the people that are going to get value from that communication so that you don't have to pick through all the things that may be interesting to other people that she knows but aren't really that interesting to you. The second is that you'll rarely see her just sharing things on their own without any sort of added value at all. So it takes her a little longer to post something because she always adds a little bit of herself into everything that she shares. So when she posts something, you'll see her talking about what the idea means to her, how she's used this in a particular situation, how this combines with another things that, that she's seen and makes a connection for her audience that they may not have seen. Or she may even share some counterfactual information there in order to drive a discussion related to the particular topic that she's sharing. Now, the reason that you see folks like Sophie behaving in this way is that they've come to realize a couple of key things. The first is that they've realized that networks are everywhere. We are born into networks. The network of our family, the network of the friends of our family, our communities, our nationalities, even our ethnicities and orientations. 
All these are networks that are impossible for us to change our membership in or extremely difficult to do so. As we get older, we find out about more networks that we have a little more latitude about whether we join or not. The cool kids at school, the parent teacher association, even the people that we play Xbox and PlayStation games with. All of these networks are around us. We're surrounded by networks. We are a network being. And because of the proliferation of all these networks and the social tools that are out there, there's an abundance of information and sharing that's going on in our world. Two key statistics that really bear this out for me. One is that according to YouTube, if you wanted to watch all of the video that was uploaded in 2013, it would take you 6,000 years to do so. And the second is that according to Technorati, there were over 1 billion with a B blog posts that were created just last year. Now, even if you subscribe to Surgeon's Law that says that 90% of everything is crap, and you take that 10% that's left over and only take one out of 100 things there because the others just aren't that relevant or interesting to you, those two sources alone can provide you more content than you could possibly consume. So we can be very picky about when and where we get information. Because if we miss that particular bit of information, there's going to be another one by later on whenever we are ready to consume it, share it, and use it. So we don't have to stress about missing out on everything. There's so much that's out there that whenever we choose to engage, there's going to be things out there that are interesting to us. So the end result for folks like Sophie is that the sky is really the limit. Because of the abundance of things that are out there and their realization of all the connections that are there, they realize that they can be very deliberate in how they use social media and maximize the value and really make it work for them versus being a slave to their technology. Now, there's some simple steps that any person can take that can help us to learn from and become more like the homo socialist profile that we talked about. Now, the first piece of this is going to sound a little odd because it's not really about technology, but it's foundational and fundamental to be able to do anything else with technology. You have to understand what success means to you. And the reason that that's so important is because as a species and certainly as individuals, we have more options on how to live our lives and how to get meaning from our lives than any of our ancestors have ever had. And while that's an opportunity for us, it's also a burden because we have to actually choose how we want to live our lives. So in order to do this, there's a few simple questions that you can ask yourself. What is it that you want to be? Not what you want to have, or what you want to be in 20 years, but what is it that you want to be today? Do you want to be more loving? Do you want to be more rich? Do you want to be uh, in more exciting experiences? And what sort of experiences are they that you want to have? What are the things that you want to be able to reflect back on that you've actually done and accomplished? And who are the people that you want to build close relationships with and that you ultimately want to be close to and be able to trust? Ask yourself those questions, reflect on them, write your answers down, and then look at them because they not only form the basis for how to use social tools effectively, they also help you with the rest of your life as well. So that's just an added bonus. Once you have an understanding of what success means to you, then you can start to shape your environment to help you actually get success. Now, regardless of what it is that you define as success, it's almost certainly not seeing how many possible alerts and notifications that you can get on your phone this year. So I would advise you that all of those alerts and notifications and badges that you get through your various tools that beep and chirp at you, turn them all off and set everything that comes new to you as off by default. Now this is kind of scary, but keep in mind that over the last several thousand years, we've managed to get by without being instantly accessible around the world at any point right away. Only turn on the things that are truly necessary for you to have in place, things that you can't wait on, that are really things that are important to you, and the people that really matter. And that should be a very small subset of that. It's just not everything. And set smart boundaries around how you use social tools. 
I don't mean that whenever you see somebody using Facebook in public, you need to knock their phone out of their hand and give them a lecture. That's way too far. Be smart about how you set boundaries. If you're engaged in a conversation, you need to be engaged in a conversation. Or if you don't want to be engaged in a conversation, tell the person that you don't want to really talk with them at that point because you've got other things that you'd rather do and go do those things. Is it a bit rude? Yeah, it can come across that way. The issue is that if you don't do that, you end up sitting there checking your phone, just like that example we talked about earlier, and ultimately putting barriers between people rather than being more candid and upfront with them about that. Now, there's still going to be situations where you're going to feel overwhelmed, where too many things are coming in compared to the number of things that the amount of time that you have. So you have to be smart about pruning and weeding your networks on a regular basis. What are the things that are no longer serving you? What are the sources of information that aren't providing much value? Don't apologize to anybody for ignoring, unfollowing, hiding, moving something off to a feed that you only check once a week or once a month. It's your attention. It belongs to you. No one else is entitled to it. Regardless of what they may have done for you in the past or what their expectations are, your attention is yours and it's the most valuable thing that you have. So take care of it and make sure that you're able to use it for the things that ultimately matter to you and help you to be successful. And make sure that you're building relationships with the people that are around you, as well as other people that share your interests. Now, network complexity can, can get pretty hairy, but there's a pretty simple equation that if you'll keep it in mind, you'll be fine in just about any situation. The amount of value that you give versus the amount of value that you get. And if you're giving more than you're getting, things are going to go pretty well for you as a general rule. And I would encourage you to give first. Find out what things are valuable to other people. Make sure that they get those things. The more that you're able to deliver value versus the value that you take, first of all, the more value that you can actually take without being greedy, which is nice. And another piece of that is that when you give a lot of value, the people you're connected to will help you connect to other people that can prove even more valuable to you. Because ultimately, those relationships that allow us to build that tacit knowledge are the most powerful way that we have to build value with others. And when we do those sorts of things, we're getting value whether we're teaching other people or whether we're learning from other folks. So focus on those common interests and connect regularly with other people. Because ultimately we feel close to the people that we talk to a lot and that we're talking about things that are interesting to them. And in these relationships, you'll start to get attention. And it's important that we understand that attention is the most valuable thing that exists in our world today, because we can use attention to get all the money that we want. So any scrap of attention that you get is valuable and you need to use it well. If you're getting positive feedback about something you're doing, that's a sign that you need to continue to invest in that area. Double down in that space, really pour the coals to it, as the old saying goes, and make sure that you're continuing to deliver value there. When you get negative feedback, don't waste energy on trying to explain or deny it or try to get pity for it or argue with the person that's giving you that attention. The fact that they're giving you attention is valuable, but you negate the value of that if you try to convince them why you're right instead of trying to learn from that. So when you get that negative feedback, refine what you're doing. Look at other ways that you may be able to do the same thing, but deliver it in a different way so that people are able to understand it and get value from it. And even if you're subject to trolling, hate speech, and some of the other awful things that we see online, the fact that you're getting attention is still a signal that you're focused on the right areas and that you're, you're hitting a nerve with things. And while it'd be easy to stop whenever we have to deal with those sorts of awful things, I would encourage you to persevere through those. Refine and adjust. Reach out to people that you trust. Ask them for feedback about what it is that you're doing. And if you're not getting any feedback at all and you're not getting attention, take a step back and reassess. Don't try to do three times as much stuff because three times zero is still zero. Instead, you really need to take a step back and try to understand what is it that other people value? What is it that they really want? 
if there's one thing that anybody that works in the IT service management space should know, it's that value doesn't come from how much effort that we put into things. It's value is determined by the people that receive whatever it is that we're delivering. So we have to understand what it is that they want, what are the things that they need, and then let's try to deliver those things to them. And that should start to help us get more attention so that we can then refine and learn from what we're doing. And lastly, use the attention that you have in order to invest that in others effectively. In Silicon Valley, there's a concept of a venture capitalist. These are people that take large sums of money and they invest them in people that have good ideas, but no money. And you can be, and anyone can be a venture attentionalist. Invest your attention in other people that are producing good content, that are sharing interesting ideas, unique insights, but don't necessarily have a large audience. When you share those things to your audience, you're helping them to connect with other people and to get more attention for what they do, and that benefits them. You're also bringing value to your audience, so you also benefit from that. And your audience benefits because they're being exposed to ideas that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. So being a venture attentionalist is something that's really a win-win-win all the way around. So I'd like to at this point check and see if we've got any questions. And uh, as I've been preparing for this discussion, I've talked to a couple of people and gotten some questions already. So we'll see what we've got in here. All right. So the first question is, you know, there's a lot of expectation about that people demand attention and that we really don't have any choice into, you know, if my boss wants to see me immediately, then I have to be able to drop everything at a moment's notice and give them attention. Now, it is true that a lot of folks have been conditioned in order to get attention from us at the drop of a hat. And it's really a two-way street because in many cases, we've actually taught them that it's perfectly okay for them to interrupt us. So we really have to understand what sort of boundaries that we want to set around us. What's the value that we're getting from that relationship? Is that value more than what we would get if we were to set some clearer boundaries, if we were to say to our boss or to other people, you know, if you really urgently need to reach me, send me a text. But if you're, it's not that important, just send me an email and I'll check that later on. And if we set those smart boundaries around there and we let people know what to expect from us, they're much more likely to use the, the boundaries that we set in order to ultimately help us stay more focused on what we're doing while still giving them the attention that they need to be able to do the stuff that they're trying to do. Looking to see if we've got any other questions. So at this point, unless I'm missing something, I think that's everything that we have. Uh, so I don't want to take too much of your time and uh, do want to leave you with one thought before we wrap up today. So we've looked at a lot of different things. And uh, the journey that we're on is really just starting, and it's going to continue to go over time. And uh, we're going to learn, continue to learn a lot about this space. So as we move along, some of the concepts that are in this video will make sense. Others we'll find just don't work at all, and we'll learn other things. So I'd like to leave you with this thought. Networks are the future, yet they can be quite unforgiving. Anybody that's been picked on by the cool kids at school knows this all too well. So the last bit of advice I give you is to be kind to yourself and others. Be generous with your time and with your attention where you can. And be grateful for everything that we have because we have opportunities and resources and an abundance that has never been seen before in our history. After all, we're all part of a network called the human race. And what we do to others, we ultimately do to ourselves. Best wishes in creating the future that you desire. Thank you very much.